Good afternoon. Good afternoon. You know, launching a book requires skills that you've probably never needed before, right? And there is no magic formula. We each must find our own way, develop our own marketing strategy. Knowing what other people have Good done. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Close this in. Knowing what other people have done and how they've done it can save us much time and frustration. Today's guest, author Zena Hermes, shares a bit of her marketing journey on Marketers on a Mission, episode number 100. Number 100, baby! Three pre-launch marketing tips with guest author Zena Hermes. Hello, Zena. How are you? Great. How are you? Oh, my goodness. It's so good to see you and hear more about your journey. Do this for me, if you would. While I'm taking a moment to share our live link over on my Facebook page, would you please tell me, what is Gratitude Court, and how did it impact your life? Gratitude Court. I think oh, you mean Grammar Secret. Oh, I'm sorry. I saw it in your book, in your, in your promo. Yeah. yeah, Grammar Court is the name of the street I grew up on, mm -hmm. and that's where the accident happened. While I was trying to cross the street on my way to school on a dark and rainy morning, I was hit by a car. The bus that came to pick me up had already passed, and I was trying to reach a friend's bus stop. His came a little later. So I write about Gramercy Court in the book because it, mercy means many thanks. Mm -hmm. So that's probably where you, you got that from. I'm thankful to be alive. And despite of the horrific tragedy, I'm thankful for what the Lord has done in my life. And he's done a lot, hasn't he? He sure has. Uh, he, he's, uh, if, he was, if he wasn't as big as he was, he would have been overwhelmed with the things that he needed to do for you, wouldn't he have? Right, but he's huge. <laughs> uh, let's first talk about, oh, let's, let me give you the rundown, please. And what I'd like to talk about your book, I'd like to talk about uh, the, your ministry and um, the various aspects of your work, your second upcoming book that's going to be right around the corner. And then we'll get to the three pre-launch marketing tips. Is that all right? Is that sequence okay? Sure. All right, good, good, good. In 1994, you just mentioned that you were injured in a car accident. Now, you weren't even in the car. You were walking. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then you wrote a book, which is, has a beautiful cover, by the way. I love it. Do you have it have, handy? Mm hmm? Do you have your book handy? I didn't think to ask I you do. to have it handy. I do. Oh, yeah, baby. There's the author. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? That's just gorgeous. Thank just gorgeous. you. And it's titled, Not Without God, A Story of Survival. In the reviews for your book, I saw words like raw, transparent, authentic, mm -hmm. all of those words, and, and more. Good, good reports, reviews from the people who are, have um, posted on Amazon, your Amazon page. And in your prologue, you write that well before your accident, God revealed that your path would not be easy. Tell us more about that, please. I'd be happy to. As a child, I would ride my bicycle up and down the street. Um, we had a cul-de-sac and I would often stop and climb the top of the tree over there. I was pretty active. I played sports. I was kind of a tomboy. And I would hear from the Lord on my daily bike rides and I felt his presence so strongly. And he would say to me, this road will not be easy, Zena but I will never leave you nor forsake you. And I remember those words distinctively. They may not have been words, more of whispers in my heart, I could call them. And the, his presence was so strong. It's as if he was introducing me to what was to come. Mm -hmm. However, letting me know that I would not be alone and I would make it through. He often prepares us ahead of time for what is coming that he can see that we have no clue about. Exactly. It's a kindness, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Thank you, Lord. Um, and then when you were uh, hit by this car, they, you were told that you'd never walk again, and yet you have a very full life. Tell us what's going on with that aspect of the um, yeah, I had very severe injuries. Um, after the crash, I sustained a, a spinal cord injury. My spine not only shifted, but broke at the L2, L3 level. 
And I also had uh, broken tibias and fibulas. My left femur was shattered. I, need, I had a, sustained a mild head injury. I needed rods and screws to hold my broken lower, my broken bones in place. And you know, with a spinal cord injury, the statistics are grim. Doctors usually don't give you much hope um, to walk because few people do. And I was told by a few uh, medical professionals that I would be wheelchair bound my whole life. And I'm not, I'm not wheelchair bound. I'm able to walk with two forearm crutches. They're like the ones with the rings around the arms. And they're pretty lightweight. They're easy to throw in and out of my car. But I've worked really hard for a lot of years. I've done hundreds and hundreds of hours of physical therapy to fight the wheelchair. And I still exercise for several hours a week to this day because I would like to be able to walk uh, without walking devices but I still have lots of um, tightness in my back and my hips and some general weakness all over. And the accident was when you were 16. So we're talking right. about something that happened early, early on in your life. Exactly. Did it set the tone for your life or is it an event in your life? It's an event, but you know, my writing is so much based around, you know, what happened because I can't write about God without mentioning the accident. And I can't mention the accident without writing about God because he's the one that, that brought me through and helped me survive. That makes complete sense. Two pieces of the whole, isn't it? Exactly. Let me check Facebook and see if we have any comments or questions, Zena. Mm, chapter, oh, excuse me, Chaplain. <laughs> Chaplain Bob Osler says, love this topic. Hi, Zena. I messaged you. God bless you, Zena. That's chapter, Chaplain Bob Austin. Thank you so much. God bless you, too. Uh, if, uh, Bob Ostler is a, a chaplain that, who served in, uh, at 9-11, and he has, has written a book called Triumph Over Terror with his co-author, Janice Paul Heck. Heck, and they're, they're, they're doing phenomenal work with that. The Lord is blessing their efforts. Um, let's say you're a teacher, you're a writer, you homeschool teacher, English as a second language tutor, an English tutor. You love words. You love communication, don't you? I do. And I love working with people. Give me some examples. Of how long have you been doing this? What kind of stories do you have to share of success stories or a challenging student that you were able to help him or her turn their, turn their future around because they could read or speak the language correctly? Sure. I was um, asked to tutor composition classes right out of college because my professor thought that I was doing a good job and he thought it'd be a great fit. So I started tutoring composition classes around 20 years ago and that's how I got into education. Mm -hmm. And then I studied English. I majored in English and minored in history. And uh, that's how I got into the writing as well as the teaching. But I've been doing it for a very long time. I've had thousands of students. I've been fortunate to work with people from all over the world, different age ranges. I've tutored everything from, you know, elementary math to high school algebra to grammar for English as a second language. And it's been great to see some of the progress that students have made. You know, when parents tell me how much I've helped their child, huge blessing. I recently wrote a recommendation letter for a, a doctor who I was teaching English as a second language to. He wanted to transfer to New Zealand and be able to study medicine and work over there. And he needed this recommendation letter. So I was really happy to write that for him. And you know, the, the, the way that people are so grateful is, is rewarding, you know, after they learn from you. And what you're talking to them about, what you're teaching them and helping them to learn is so applicable and so practical to their everyday life. I mean, this can change one of those areas that can really change someone's life. Absolutely. I like that you teach the younger all the way up to the adult professional. That's quite a broad range. Yeah, I do the private tutoring more in the summertime. And then in the fall and winter, I teach classrooms, but I still maintain some tutoring as well. Mm. Okay, okay. So let's talk about your beautiful book. You've written one, 
and your second one is ready to launch. How do you uh, get the work? I know we're going to talk about three marketing, pre-launch marketing mm -hmm. tips in a moment, but how do you get the word out and what kind of reception has your, is, has your book had so far? It's had great reception. Uh, for our first book, I've had quite a few book signings. I've had, I've sold, you know, more copies than I expected, you know, when I first had it published. And I, I feel like all of the support that I gained from writing the book has been really encouraging people actually taking the time to come out to events and inquire and buy the book. It's, it's, it's been really, um, encouraging for me to know that people care and not only that they care but they support me as well yes and this was uh, published in 2014 am i remembering correctly yeah the official release date was in october 2014 for not without god a story of survival the first book the first there's more to come uh before we get to the second book that you're working on right now did you go with the first book did you go traditional or indie publishing I actually had a hybrid publisher, so somewhere in between, I would say. Did you happen to, we don't have to go into this in depth, but did you happen to meet them at a conference or something? How did the Lord hook you up with that person? I did. I met my publishers at uh, Author 101 University when I went to Los Angeles, and then I met them a second time when I went to um, Las Vegas, because there was another Author 101 University there. And Morgan James Publishing, are, those were my publishers. They did a fantastic job. I'm very grateful to them. Okay, I'm going to, viewers, like I always do, I'm going to add every link that we mentioned, every resource that Zena mentions above the video after the episode airs. So I want to add to that Author 101 University. Is that the name of it? Yes, that was the name of the conference. Okay, I want to uh, add that. Um, that'll be helpful, helpful to somebody. Uh, so now tell us about the second book, please. Well, Hope After the Storm is also a narrative like my first one, but it's a little bit different because I actually leave journal sections at the end of various chapters where the reader can write and reflect. So I also tell my story about, you know, the accident and how I've coped how I've gotten to where I am now, but I ask a series of questions at the end of various chapters so the, so the reader can not only read, but learn about themselves. I'd like it to be therapeutic, kind of a healing book. And it's, it's exciting that I get to incorporate some teaching background. And I feel like I'm doing that by incorporating the essay style, you know, and having people read and interact. I noticed that in all of the reviews for your first book that, <clears throat> excuse me, that everybody remarked on the fact that even though it was your story of a spinal cord injury, that the principles and the lessons and the insights that you shared were applicable across the board if you're in crisis or struggling deeply. Mm, that's a great way to write a book and make it broaden your audience base. Definitely. And I want to help people who've had accidents because, you know, so many people lose hope, especially after a spinal cord injury. It's really difficult, you know, to walk again after paralysis. So that's one of the reasons that I wrote the book. But I'd like to help, you know, anyone who's going through adversity or hardship, not only people who've had accidents. I just want them to know that the Lord can be with you and he can help you to overcome anything. Thank you, Phone. Can you give us an example of one time or two times that it was a turning point perhaps and he spoke to you or um, just a quiet moment and he said exactly the right thing or sent someone to serve you in a specific way that you just confirmed again, that's my God. He knows who I am. He's taking care of me. Yeah, that's great that you mentioned that because I feel like I have gotten that confirmation. And one example that comes to mind is you know, when you go to the doctor and you may not hear something that you like, you may not feel comfortable with what the doctor told you, or you may not, you know, want to take the medication that he's prescribing. And I think it's okay to get a second opinion because that's what I did in a recent situation. So I went to 
a second doctor, and I still was not too comfortable with his recommendations or diagnosis. And then I thought, well, God, please lead me to the right medical. You know, I was dealing with a side effect from my spinal cord injury, and I asked the Lord to send me to the right medical professional to help me with a with a with a problem and he sent me right back to the University of Michigan my children's hospital that's where I was hospitalized at the time of my accident and I'm now working with um, a University of Michigan health professional to help with my recent condition due to my accident and I know that my health is in the right hands I'm fully aware of that um, the doctor my, the doctor I'm working with now, she's very inspiring. She has a plan. She's not um, trying to give me too much medication or perhaps the wrong medication. She sits down and speaks with me and she's really innovative. I like her. And I know that the Lord has sent, has sent me to her. So I'm happy about that. Oh, I love that story because we all we all are in that place. Everybody, not every moment of every day, but we all have those times where we our, our resources are exhausted. We've done the research, we've tried out everything, and still don't have the answer we're searching for. And he makes it look so effortless, doesn't he? He does. <laughs> so now you also have a second website, Spinal Cord Injury Zone. Tell us about that, please, and who it's. Obviously, it serves who, who it serves is. Obviously, who it serves is. is um, oh my gosh! You know what I'm trying to say. I'm I know. Thumbling there. What do you do for those people? How do you have outreach for them? What is the purpose of that website? Spinal cord injury zone is more of a portal where people can write articles who've had spinal cord injuries. So I've been I've written several articles on their website. And that's when I first started writing several years ago, I, I put up articles on there and that's where a lot of people who've had accidents found me and they started visiting my website and leaving those nice comments like, I'm really inspired or my son just had a car accident, what do you recommend? If you visit my website, you may notice some of those comments on there by mostly people who've been in accidents that want to learn how to get better and how to even walk or how their child can walk again. So I don't own Spinal Cord Injury Zone, but they definitely helped me get started with my own blog because I started blogging around the same time and I feel like they redirected a lot of patients and even families of patients to my website that really wanted some inspiration. Mm. I appreciate the fact that that follows the, the Christian methodology of marketing, serve first, and then the people will come. Exactly, mm. exactly. How did you determine it was time to write the book? How did that trigger come about that the decision was made of all the things that have happened to me and I'm this many years past my accident, but now I know I can just tell it's time to write that book. How did that come about? Well, when I was at Matt Children's, I would write in my journal every night. I, you know, I, the lights were off. I was in my hospital bed. I'd hold on to a flashlight with a pen and a pad in the other hand, and I'd listen to music in the background, and I'd write directly to the Lord. And that was a way to help me um, get through all of, you know, the physical pain and mental anguish that I was going through while I was in the hospital. So I started writing very early on and I saved those journal articles and I had them for many years. And I always dreamt of writing a book and reaching out to others. So once I started, once I got serious about writing the book, I would say, well, the book was published in 2014, probably around 2011, I would guess, maybe 2013 that I started getting onto the computer night after night and writing this book out, I started incorporating the journal articles from when I was 16 years old. So I feel like I've been writing the book <laughs> for half of my life, if that makes any sense. I've always been writing the book, but it, by, you know, because of the miracle of the Lord, he helped me to put it together. Without him, I wouldn't have been able to do any of it. And he wouldn't have led me to the wonderful people who've helped me promote it, like yourself, for example. So. <laughs> Did you go to a writer's conference to learn or to meet, um, to participate? How, how did they help you, writer's conferences? 
That's a great question. I actually reached out to a writer who lived in who lives in West Michigan. He's a little bit far from where I live. And I was asking him for writing advice because here I was typing out this book, but I didn't know any publishers. I didn't know any editors. And he gave me really wonderful advice. He told me about the Breathe Writers Conference in, in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And he also told me about Fellowship of Christian Writers, which is an online Yahoo group where you can meet publishers and editors and agents. And I just sent out a heartfelt email. It went out to all 800 members. A lot of seasoned writers were on there. And I just said, this is my story. And, you know, I'm trying to write this book about, you know, this accident I was in as a teenager and how I'm, you know, recovering and I'd like to help other people. And fortunately I was responded to pretty quickly by, by a well-known editor. So it just, my career took off from there and I feel like the Lord designed it that way. It wasn't difficult. Some people struggle and struggle and struggle. And that's what he, that's the path he wants them to travel. Um, other people don't, he opens doors and just one thing leads to another and it's, it's seamless and it's, uh, um, it's obvious that it's him either way. He's with us either way. He opened some wide doors. Mm. So <clears throat> what about, um, the, what's the, do you have a working title for your second book? And what's the topic? Yeah, it will be the second in my two part, Not Without God series. It will be called Not Without God, Hope After the Storm. So it will be a narrative, but at the same time, I'm asking people to write journal entries after various chapters to reflect and write about, you know, things that are going on in their own life. For example, I have a whole chapter on relationships, and I ask the reader to evaluate the health of their relationships by asking a series of questions. And then I ask the reader to reread what they wrote and take note of any harmful thought patterns. Mm -hmm. So if the reader notices any harmful thought patterns, I leave additional pages in the back of the book so they could write and change their attitude because that's one strategy that I've used throughout my life. When I journal, after all my words are out, I go back and reread what I wrote and then I'm able to notice, well, maybe this is me or maybe I'm not completely feeling the way that I'm supposed to be. I might be feeling negative or disappointed. So I'm trying to get the reader to take note of that in my relationships chapter. That's just one example. Uh -huh. I like that. Uh, again, practical, insightful. Mm -hmm. Let me check Facebook again, please. I'm not going from taking notes of resources that you mentioned to checking Facebook. <laughs> multitasking, always multitasking. You're good at it. Um, thank you very much. What do you think is a, what's the next after the second one? What do you, do you, can you share what you're thinking about the third one? I've thought about writing a prayer book, like something like 12 steps to, um, or 12 different ways to pray. So for example, I pray a lot when I'm walking on the treadmill, when I'm running on the elliptical, I just pour out my thoughts and I pray for family and friends. I pray for us in mind, body, and spirit. I pray for relatives. I pray, I pray for students, medical professionals. And I, I thought it'd be nice to actually write a book about prayer because surprisingly enough, so many, I feel like so many people don't know how to pray. And I always say, well, you can just talk to the Lord like you would talk to your friend. That's a form of prayer. And you can share your thoughts or you can give him requests. Of course, you want to give him thanks. I try to give him as much thanks as I ask, you know, as requests, because I have to give him praise. So I try to keep that in mind. But I feel like people could uh, use some help with how to pray. Why do you think that a lot of people don't know how to pray, Zena? That's a great question. I'm not too sure. I don't know if it's because they were raised in a home where their parents maybe didn't address the topic or if they haven't read the Bible too much, they may not, they may not have enough knowledge 
of how to ask God or socialize with God because they may not know enough about God. And that's one thing I wanted to mention. Before the accident happened, I was kind of in that place. I was praying regularly for understanding, even though I felt the presence strongly. Like I mentioned on those bike rides, I really felt him telling me I'm with you, and even though it would not be easy. But shortly before the accident happened, I was regularly praying for understanding. My surroundings had me confused. I knew there was a God, but I just wanted to understand more. So when as horrible as the accident was, I felt like I had a kind of revelation where through the doctors and nurses and others who were fighting for my life, I really witnessed the love of Christ. And I felt like what I was, I found what I was searching for. And I feel like a lot of people are in that place. And we know when we've reached that, that, that thing that we're searching for, when we've got it, we've got a hold of it. It's got a hold of us. We know it, don't we? We do. It's a wonderful feeling, too. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Thank you. It's great. I find that praise changes my attitude and straightens me up. And when I want to pray for 30 minutes and browbeat the Lord, asking the same question over and over and over, if I will stop and praise him, it opens up my mind and my heart and it removes, not that I don't have a right to pray and asking for things because that's part of who he is, but um, I need to be careful where I focus my praise. Sure. How did you find praise to be a part of your life? It had to have been this traumatic accident and all the repercussions from it. I feel like praise just comes in naturally where there are times where I just have to stop and say, thank you, God. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that I have had so much hardship because, you know, when you're low, you really get to see, wow, you know, this is, I, I'm in a low place right now. But I forgot that I could be here when I was feeling high, you know, and it, being in that place really shows you that, you know, you have to appreciate the times when things are going good, when your loved ones are doing well, when you're doing well, you can't take that for granted because you could get to the place where everything's not going, not going so good. And then you, yeah, no, go ahead, go ahead. And you forget where you were before. So I definitely try to thank him for what I have, even when things are not going well. Of course, I'm human and I forget to do that. And sometimes I complain, but I try not to go from complain to complain. I try to go from praise to praise, but I struggle with that at times. Well, as we do, as everyone does, my tongue is not cooperating with me today. <laughs> But we're just making it work. It's just because just, we're talking about God and your story and your books and your ministry and the changes that have occurred to, in your life that you then share those insights with other people, changing, helping them find the path to a changed life in Christ. Right. That's you must right. be very fulfilled, Zena, are you? I do feel fulfilled. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So we, you were going to share three pre-launch marketing tips with us today. And I'm particularly intrigued by them because they were for your first book. And the mm -hmm. first one, you know, is the first one's a little nerve wracking, isn't it? It is. <laughs> what do you have to share with us today? Sure. My first tip is pretty basic. Uh, before my book was published, my publishers had me do a 90-day action plan. So the action plan consisted of many things. I did what I was able to fit into my schedule. And one of the tasks was to write in your blog every single day for 90 days. Mm -hmm. And that may sound intimidating because if you're a writer, you know how much time that could take. But what I did was I used snippets from my book and I just reworded them and added additional thoughts. And I would download like a Canva image. Well, I was using PicMonkey at the time. And then now I've switched to using Canva.com. But if you don't know what that is, it's where you can actually add graphics mm -hmm. to, your, to your blog site. So I have the Canva app. It's actually right on my cell phone. And it's really neat because if you pull out a quote from your book, 
you can just write it into the app and then pick out a neat design like mountains or nature or something that you feel matches your message. And you can post it to your social media or to your blog. So that was the way that I designed a blog every single day by using graphics and using a snippet from my booklet. And I did that for 90 days. I started a free blog at wordpress.com. I recommend wordpress.com if you don't have a blog. It's user friendly and you don't have to post some really long fancy article. It can just be something short and sweet and send it off. I really like the uh, brilliance of repurposing content that's already been created. You package it differently, but it's the same truth and it's still powerful no matter whether it's on social media or in your book or on your blog. I love that too. And you don't have to start from zero every single time you sit down to write. Exactly. Because that, that can be really time consuming. And, and it can make you feel that you don't have enough to say and that's not true. Exactly. Mm. Okay. So that's number one. Next. My second tip is posting to social media, of course, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, even YouTube. I had started a Faith Tips series on YouTube, and I posted several videos. I plan to relaunch that program 90 days before my, my second book comes out. Mm -hmm. And um, LinkedIn, if you're not on LinkedIn, you know, Pinterest, you can utilize as many social media sites as you can. I named the, the important ones. There's even a, a Buffer app. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Buffer where you can schedule your posts and automatically send it to all of your social media sites. So for 90 days before my book came out, I wrote a quote from my book or a thought that I had in relation to my writing. And I would, would send it off to all of my social media sites through Buffer. I did that every two to three days. And that was the second part to my action plan. And I, I used Canva, like I mentioned, sometimes I just put quotes right up on Canva. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that got people used to my voice because as a nonfiction writer, you have to get people used to your voice. And I think that was a great tool to get people, you know, accustomed to my message and what I was, what I was uh, discussing with them. And how did you find your voice? I'm still checking Facebook periodically. How did you find your voice? I think it's hard to get comfortable with your voice. I think you, your voice is innate and everyone has a different one. Even Christian writers, we may be talking about the same thing, but we may I'll put it a different way. Mm -hmm. So I feel like the voice is natural, but I would say it takes time to develop your voice. So writing doesn't come easily. It comes with skill, just like anything else. It's a lot of hard work. I would not say that it's been easy to write, you know, a first book, a second book. It's been time consuming more than anything else. But you, I mean, anyone can be a writer, but if you want to promote your book, there's additional work. And some of these pre-launch steps are what you, <laughs> you know, and some of these pre-launch steps are what you need to do to actually promote your writing. And even though, excuse me, it is time consuming at the same time to be able to have that knowledge and do it ahead of time. So your book hits hopefully with some momentum to start with. Exactly. Did you discover that that was the way it worked for you, that there was a little bit of momentum, interest had been built up to some degree? Well, I was building it over time because I was, I was writing in my blog, you know, at least two years before the book was actually published. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't um, where, you know, the book was launched and I had this wonderful 90 day plan and all these people were taking note of my writing. I had been writing for a while before that. So that's my other tip. You need to start as soon as possible. If you want to be an author, the sooner you start, the better. The sooner you start blogging, the sooner you start posting quotes or posting ideas, because it doesn't just happen after your book is launched. You really have to market. No matter what publishing route you go, you really have to market and you really have to build your audience. Have you been able to maintain your audience and then continue to grow it, Zena? 
I think so. It's it's hard to tell, but I know that I have a lot of the same friends who, you know, will make a comment or show interest in, in something I've said or I've written. And, and that's been encouraging, too, to know that people still care. Yes, of course, of course. And your words are still impacting people. I hope so. Mm, thank you, Lord. Mm. So thank you so much for joining me today. It's been a pleasure to learn more about you and hear your story. Thank you for having me. I like that this is your first Facebook Live session. I always like doing the fir someone's first one. It just sort of sets the tone. <laughs> really exciting. Uh, viewers, thanks so much for joining us. This has been Marketers on a Mission number 100, three pre-launch marketing tips with guest author Zena Hermes. On Monday, we're going to have a little bit of a special show. Twyla Belk is going to join me, but we're going to twit turn the tables. She's going to interview me in honor of today's show with Zena, number 100. Hmm. Plus, next week, I have another great lineup of interviews for you. All of that happens every day right here on my page, prof page and my profile at 12, P 12 Pacific, 3 Eastern. I hope you have a good weekend. And until then, I'm Patricia Durkin, the Christian Message Coach, and I pray that more people come to Christ because of your online message. Thanks very much for being here. Thanks again, Zena. Thank you so much.